The Pharmac 4 model, that positive center with the aromatic functionality on mm -hmm. both sides, if you've got that, you definitely have to be wary. Um, but you can get HERG activity for things that yeah. don't match that at all. And uh, we developed a HERG model a while ago, actually, based on structures, and exactly, sometimes it was pretty predictive, and sometimes it was not predictive at all. And um, yeah, so it's, it's a very difficult property to predict, which makes sense, because the HERG uh, is really flexible. Yeah. Incredibly flexible, right? So it's, uh, you're looking at an induced fit kind of effect. Yeah, that, that binding area, the binding site in, in the channel is actually large uh, relative to other potassium channels, and that's part of the, the issue, is that it can just accept a lot of different chemotypes. Yeah, I mean, it, th there, are th there are some things that you might be able to do. Uh, I mean, if you can introduce a, a, an acid group into your molecule, that tends to work, but you, I mean, that, that could kill your primary activity pretty easily or, or your cell activity. Um, and if, if you have kind of a basic group that seems to be the problem and you, you need that for your activity as well, it can be really difficult to, to kind of dig yourself out of that hole. Okay. Yeah, and then it's time to start thinking about swapping the core. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so in, in terms of core hopping, I mean, you, you don't necessarily need a crystal structure. I mean, so okay. some of the, the examples that I, 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 uh, that I went through, mm -hmm. I mean, we had structural data and we had structural models that, that helped guide us in terms of the... Uh, um, like the precise um, geometry of, of the small molecule bound to, to target, but uh, you can also do this sort of thing um, using um, kind of conformational ensembles, kind of low energy minima, in, in, kind of in conformational space. Um, I've done this before uh, using QM as, as a basis for kind of finding those minima and then um, trying to, to do something like a recore type exercise and looking just at, at, at the geometric fit and, and, and any pharmacophoric information I might have about the core that I'm trying to, to replace. I mean, it, it, it can be really tough. Yeah, because you're basic, yeah. Uh, just building on that idea, there are multiple approaches to do that, either maintaining key interactions, maintaining shape, and yeah, lots of different ways that you can swap out cores, either from a synthetic retractable uh, kind of uh, vantage point or from a recore keeping, preserving geometry kind of vantage point. But the trick here is the fact that there's no HERC model that, that um, you can reliably imply, uh, employ. So it's going to be based on chemical intuition, what was observed in the past with that particular type of combination of um, uh, functionality that you're, you're displaying to the receptor. Yeah, we were actually chatting about that earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, it, it's a very difficult problem. And the, the real question is, what is it that you're trying to solve, right? Are you trying to find... Uh, yeah, so if you've already got a linker, then it's a more tractable problem. If you're trying to find a linker, um, then you run into issues because you can recreate things that are going to be crystal structure-alike, but the HDX data suggests that the crystal structure isn't necessarily the, the structure that's actually in the flask, right? And so you're optimizing something that might not have any relevance. But if you already have a linker that you're starting with and you want to rigidify you want to sh uh, reduce the length, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, we've been working with some clients that um, are using kind of a pharmacophore based approach in order to do that, um, where they're restricting, essentially, you can almost think of it like ReCore, yeah. actually, uh, where they're restricting the, the, the vectors going into uh, the, 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 the two warheads, right? Um, and then uh, you're using standard approaches to try and um, find new chemistry, you know, enumeration based approaches or ReCore based approaches to find the new chemistry. Uh, in order to be able to uh, create those linkers. Um, so that's, uh, at least our collaborator has had good success with that, but that is um, not what I would consider a standard workflow. It's mm -hmm. kind of a we're trying that and seeing if it works kind of workflow. Yeah, especially the protein path, like how do you do the fit? Like, the uh, yeah, we were talking about that earlier <laughs> as well. <laughs> You know, protein-protein docking was optimized for systems that evolutionarily are designed to fit together, right? Yeah. So you're trying to recognize those preferentially over systems that weren't designed to fit together. Well, guess what? Nature did not design protact to interact with all these. So protein-protein docking wasn't really designed to reproduce those types of interactions. So it does actually a fairly reasonable job of reproducing ensembles, but it's not going to give you an answer.
And all of the approaches computationally that have been published on this and that I've seen are based on an ensemble uh, mm -hmm. scheme. Yeah, yeah. so like the Drummond-Williams paper from earlier in the year, yeah. Exactly. It, I think at best it might get you into the, the neighborhood of a, a length that might be acceptable, but it's not going to tell you what the, what the actual answer is in terms of your, your linker length or composition. Yeah, and the main area, the main thing that's holding up this area, at least computationally, is data. There's not a lot of data available mm -hmm. out there. So for anybody that's interested <laughs> in publishing or sharing data, it would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, even going back to the, the question about RNA binding and things, I mean, that, that's... Very tricky. Yeah, it, it's tough right now. Yeah, the more information you have, and this is in general the case with docking experiments, the more information you have experimentally that you can insert into the docking experiment, the better off you'll mm -hmm. be if certain interactions are always made. If you uh, have a kinase binder, you, you know it's going to form a hinge. If it doesn't, you don't have a kinase binder. So <laughs> just, just force it to be there, right? Use whatever information you have. Well, that's a good question. I have to admit, I don't think we've run any experiment like that where there's a protein presumably protein-induced cooperative, cooperativity effect. Uh, we've done things like this where you induce a conformational change into a protein uh, using an induced fit-like approach. Um, and then, in theory, I guess you could use uh, the same thing for the second pocket and try to use um, free energy perturbation method, but that would be totally exploratory. Uh, we haven't done that, as far as I'm aware, in any meaningful project to have any kind of results. I don't know if you've done yeah. it. Um. Yeah, I mean, the immediate things that come to mind would be kind of taking a look at, at kinetics of binding, so whether you, you've got something that, that's kind of coming on and off. Um, if, you, if, if you really don't, then you, you're probably in a lot of trouble. Um, but if there are opportunities, uh, just kind of thinking out loud, if there are opportunities to um, identify things like covalent binders, um, that might help with uh, kind of the the high kind of local concentration for your second site binding that, yeah. that's, that's probably driving a lot of your your uh, your affinity and, um, and that in the anti any infective antibacterial space that's a, a pretty tried and true approach without knowing anything more about kind of your binding sites or your protein yeah I think that that's exactly where I'd go is I, I'd start taking a look at, at what that inter like if you have structural information looking at what that interface looks like and does it look like something that you could reasonably like with a reasonably sized compound come up with something that could interfere with binding um, like Matt said a lot of these PPIs are, are pretty flat and, and sometimes featureless not a lot of handholds to kind of yeah. build a molecule into but sometimes you get lucky and there may be uh, kind of a, a helical uh, kind of interface that, that might lock in and, and you might be able to find something um, that, that's on the smaller side. Yeah, and there are tools that can help you do that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, within the Schoenner suite at least there's something called site map that basically uh, grids up the surface where you're looking to see, you know, what kind of, what, is this a reasonable or druggable binding site? Mm -hmm. And uh, it'll then uh, recognize the different um, hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity, and then based on some metrics from a large range of data, um, protein binding sites uh, basically give you a, an idea, you know, is this reasonably pluggable knot and where um, on the surface. So you can use that as a way of looking at it and trying to see do we have these hooks. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so we, we use uh, the, the site map uh, method quite a bit for exactly that purpose. Uh, we'll often use something like uh, FT map or like the Atlas software mm -hmm. uh, as well just to, to try to find binding hotspots. Um, and, and when the two of those kind of suggest that you have a, a, a ligatable site, then that just increases our confidence that we're going after something that, that, we, could, that we can really work with. Uh, we run regular workshops. Um, some of them are online, some of them are local. We have a lot of videos that are available through the, the training portal. So if you look at the www.shoneyer.com um, and search for the training portal, you'll find tons and tons of videos there that cover much of the most widely used software. So for instance, we have one for uh, docking and we have one that talks through the target preparation, which is a key aspect that's over overlooked for having a successful virtual screening campaign. Um, because the, how you set up that model really matters. For instance, if you have uh, an acid, uh, acidic residue and uh, it's left protonated, which it very commonly will from some um, protein preparation software, well, that's that's un physically unrealistic and the ligands that are going to successfully bind to that are not ligands that are going to be successfully uh, successful in um, experiment all right because 
<laughs> they're just not designed for the same thing. So uh, a number of training videos are available there. Workshops are run pretty regularly. We tend to announce those um, through the website. And uh, yeah, and then the tutorials that are provided with the software can also be very helpful. Yeah, so we did actually, uh, like at MD Anderson, we hosted a, a, a local uh, Schrodinger workshop, I think about a year ago. So, so they do pop up locally as well once in a while. Yeah, we're happy to, we have a group of people, application scientists and uh, people who, uh, that's their career, right, is they train people on how to use the software, so they're very good at it. <laughs> a PPI interface, uh, you're typically looking at pretty big, pretty flat, pretty aromatic molecules, mm -hmm. so it's going to be pretty divorced from your standard small molecule library. Um, yeah, you could use some macrocyclic approaches. You could filter existing libraries um, and eliminate all the small things, just focus on the larger. But it's going to depend on what, for instance, sitemap or other approaches show in terms of what the pocket looks like. So you can filter and triage. There are some macrocyclic approaches. Um, docking software, I, I, I can only speak for Glide, but we have a macrocycle docking mode that basically uses macro model when it recognizes a macrocycle exists, does extensive conformational sampling and then uses those ring conformers in the docking experiment. Mm -hmm. It drastically slows things down. You're not going to get 10 seconds per ligand docking with that approach, but you then get uh, far more um, a reasonable binding poses. Otherwise, you're going to get uh, what comes out of the um, fraction of a second conformational sampling, which you know, for macrocycle is just not going to be great. So, but it can definitely handle macrocycles, the software. Uh, there are libraries and macrocycles. I have to admit, I don't have a whole lot of experience working with those, but. Yeah, so that, that can be really tricky because if you, if you start doing that too early, um, you're, in, a, in most cases you're going to make relatively significant changes to your molecules over time just, just to be able to improve things like affinity or, or other properties like your cell penetration, things like that. Um, so if you, if you do a lot of that ADME work early, it could send you in the wrong direction. Uh, yeah, I mean... It, if you've got things that are that are, are going to be problematic no matter what, I mean, going back to what Matt mentioned, you just want to remove those from your your screening deck. Um, but if you've got kind of if you if you do some kind of sentinel uh, metabolism studies uh, with really initial hits, you might be able to to rank order those, but but you may end up missing out on some things that that are are, are pretty um, optimizable as well. Yeah, I mean, there are general groups you want to just avoid if you yeah. can, right? And so you, that's exactly what you felt, you, what you want to filter out, as you were saying. Um, but you know, for uh, early hits, um, we don't worry about that kind of thing early on. It's it's more as you optimize and you're trying to optimize all these properties simultaneously. That's one where it, it is often functional group dependent. Yeah. So it's not typically as hard to knock out unless it happens to be in your core. Yeah. So there is software for ADME protection. Um, there is QuickProp, which is based on a number of linear models. Um, certain of those models are reasonably good. Things like log P that are functions only of the, the ligand are reasonably good. Solubility, um, until we get polymorph prediction, which the field does not have yet, uh, we're working on it. Um, uh, but until you get that solubility, it's going to be a mixed bag, right? Sometimes it'll work great, but you end up with molecule that happens to be linear and can form interactions with itself in order to form a nice uh, stable crystal, and all of a sudden the solubility is going to be different. Yeah. But other properties uh, that, that you should worry about, and I wouldn't personally trust the predictions, are anything that relies on multiple bodies. So when you've got a ligand, you're creating a ligand model for something like uh, Keiko or Herg or mm -hmm. things like that, those models are notoriously... Um, uh, not accurate or inaccurate, let's put it that way. Uh, unless you're training it specifically to your data set, your congeneric yeah. series, and then the applicability domain is relatively small, but you stay mm -hmm. in it by making lo local changes. But um, for instance, QuickProp has global models for something like KCO2 uh, and, and uh, MDCK uh, cells, and so you're, you've got a relatively finite data set that you're training against, um, and those models I wouldn't rely on personally. Yeah, th I, I'd agree. Um, I, I was involved in developing models like that um, when I was at Wyeth, and, and we ended up not really developing global models, but our global model was a whole series of local models. Yeah. And, and that worked relatively well, um, but really, once you get into a project, building a, a, a truly local model on your series is, is really the way to go. And that's going to rely on, on data. Yeah, yeah, got to have data. 
Uh, there have been various initiatives over the years to try and get companies and academics to pool data, um, but they haven't amounted to much that I'm aware of, which mm -hmm. is a shame because that would be really valuable, especially with the deep learning approaches available today where you can train yeah. to 100,000. And so, so as somebody that, that's moved from uh, industry and some of the large pharma companies where I had access to a lot of that data to an academic uh, situation now, that's one of the things that I really miss having access to is, is that those data sets that you can uh, build at least somewhat reliable models mm -hmm. from. Yeah, because at least the literature data, what I've, what I've seen, you have inconsistent measurement protocols, mm -hmm. right? And uh, it's just awfully hard to pull together global models. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we are a physics-based company at heart. Um, machine learning, there's definitely value there. But as I showed in that slide earlier, all these machine learning based approaches are all interpolative. Mm -hmm. So if they haven't seen it before, they're not going to be able to interpolate effectively. That's why I will be incredibly surprised if any of the 120, 130 companies that have sprouted up trying to do exactly that, you know, predict affinity by these machine learning approaches are going to be successful with their global models. And what I've heard is very common is they come in and they ask for a lot of data and then they train a model which has an applicability domain around mm -hmm. what they're looking for. But that means you have to have that data. Yeah. If you have that data, you already know the under you already have the SAR. You understand the SAR. The model's not having impact because it's not telling you new things you didn't already know. So what we've been doing with machine learning is trying to really understand where it can contribute significant value. Um, and we're not trying to follow the hype here. We're, we're really focused on the value. And that's why in an active learning based approach where you're training against the physics based model, which reduces the cost because you don't have to synthesize all those compounds, right? So you can take advantage of the model. You need to grow the number of compounds. Well, you can do that with FEP. And then you can create these models to look at, a, at large spaces um, with uh, tractable costs. Uh, a couple other areas we've been looking at, the generative models uh, for de novo style design where you, you're basically trying to create molecules based on an MPO. Uh, we're working with Bayer on that now. Um, uh, we've been and actually have an approach for looking at papers. So you have uh, 2D line drawings and papers and extracting that out. That's a classic uh, example. Uh, we have code that does that. Um, and then just machine learning. You know, okay, I've got this data set I want to create models for and making that democratizing that so it's easy to use. And so we, we built a tool a few years ago called AutoQSAR, uh, which basically uh, took, uh, conceptually, I think of it as taking an ADME expert, the guy we had in house, Steve Dixon, brilliant guy. Anyway, um, uh, took his workflow, more or less, with a few modifications, embedded it into the software, and it runs multiple models, it runs feature selection, it runs all the typical things you'd expect as a QSAR expert, and that way when somebody who's not a QSAR expert runs the software, they get out models that can be used in a consensus way that you're not gonna get laughed at over, right? You know, this is a reasonable model. Um, and it gives you metrics that are pretty clear, I think, in order to say what not to use. And we've done the same thing with deep learning now as well. Uh, we use TensorFlow with the, the Deep Chem open source, a library built on top of that, which we're heavy contributors to. So, um, you know, we have a team of about five people working in machine learning. It's just, we're not trying we're not trying to ride the hype curve and make money off of it. We're trying to recognize where the value is in the, the deep learning approach so that we, everybody can use it, right? And, and we, one of the main areas we think is being able to explore these broader areas of chemical space um, using computational physics-based methods. So it's available as part of the platform. Um, that is... Say if you want to adopt it, then how, what, what should we do? Um, well, <laughs> right now, yeah, right now it's, it's really used heavily by um, larger companies, AstraZeneca, uh, Bayer, um, and we build it custom built for them to run within their infrastructure. Um, but the ideas are implementable um, within your infrastructure using the tools that are available in the suite. So if you have access to FEP um, and auto QSAR, you can implement it and a version of active learning um, of, of your own, if you would like. And this idea is extendable to any approach where you have essentially a computational model that you're trying to use the deep learning in order to create a, re recreate the function, basically. And so we're doing experiments right now with active learning Glide, uh, because what we'd love to do is to be able to take these hundreds of millions, billion compounds and just use an active learning approach with a docking scoring function of Glide 
in order to be able to do that. Because um, right now, you know, there's obvious limitations um, in terms of cost. But uh, for Active Learning Glide, I'd say today you can implement it um, pretty easily, actually, um, for the scope of your computational hardware, um, simply by being able to run the command line uh, invocation of AutoQSAR and uh, FEP. Um, and for bigger companies, we implement an uh, approach that fits and scales to their hardware needs. So hundreds of GPUs, for instance, um, in most of these companies. So you're saying you're starting with a ligand that's relatively small, yeah, and then you're nice. looking to grow. Yeah, so we've done that. Um, and the basically what you do is you run a small validation experiment first. Um, and uh, typically that'll be ligands that are roughly similar sized, right? And then you start to get more experimental and you start growing out, right? And uh, if you can test a few of those experimentally, uh, that gives a lot of confidence. If you start to deviate their approaches, again, that induced fit concept where you're essentially, there's something called induced fit docking. Um, we actually just released um, a beta version of a totally new approach that uses dynamics. Uh, but anyway, what this does is it basically looks at a ligand and regrows the side chains around the ligand so that it represents the induced fit. So if you've got part of your binding pocket over on the one side that has never uh, seen a ligand in, in the crystal structure, uh, FEP up to a certain point is probably going to work. Once you get too far, maybe not. Uh, but you can use the induced fit approach once you have confidence in one of the larger uh, ligands. Just use the induced fit approach to grow further out. So and. We've, we've had success with FEP, at least with the IFDMD-based approach, um, even with homology models, so I'm pretty confident that's going to work.